Hey guys, so today we are going to cover chapter one, section three, which is all about linear functions and slope and the applications of that. I would say this is kind of one of those, um, those foundational blocks that you really need to have a good grasp on as we move forward in college algebra, because college algebra focuses a lot on graphing and a lot on how we solve these linear functions. And this chapter is going to, or this section deals with slope and you're going to have to graph a lot of lines. And the easiest way to graph lines is when you know the slope of the line. So this is kind of a big section, but hopefully a lot of it isn't like brand new material. If you've been here at Missouri Southern for a while and you've taken Math 20 or you've taken Math 30, then you would have seen a lot of this material, or really I think pretty much all of this material um, during those classes. If you haven't taken those and you're fresh out of high school or you're fresh out of the workforce or whatever the case may be, hopefully you've seen these back in Algebra 1 um, classes whenever you did take those. Um, so I have screen shared my notes yet again for this video because I think it's very helpful and then I'll work the problems on the board, but that way you can see what it is that I'm referencing and um, you have access to those without me having to rewrite them. So we learned in 1.2 what a function was. And in 1.2, we learned that a function takes an input, like your x values, and it connects those to an output. And that for every x or every input you have, that x only goes to one y or one output. You're not going to put 2 into your machine and get out 4 and 6. If you put in 2 into your function, you should always get out the same result every time. So that's what it means to be a function. So a linear function is a function of f um, if it can be written as f of x equals mx plus b, where m and b are different constants. That f of x equals mx plus b is actually our slope-intercept form. We've probably seen it more commonly written as y equals mx plus b. Remember from 1.2 that your f of x substitutes the place of the y value because it's saying the function in terms of x, which is what your y equations are. It's an equation in terms of y. And so that's what it's saying. If you can rewrite an equation to where it looks like y equals mx plus b or f of x equals mx plus b, then it is a linear function. Um, there's two kind of special functions that kind of fall after that, and that's your identity function, where you have f of x equals x. Notice that there is no m, it's just an understood one, and there is no b. That means that the, um, the intercept that it crosses the y-axis happens at the origin itself. So that's your identity function. And then there's also this constant function, this f of x equals b. And we're going to talk about that here in just a second. But this is a constant function. Notice that there is no x. So as you look at that graph, it's actually going to be a horizontal line that never changes because you don't have an x that is making it go up and down like a regular linear equation. And so whatever that B value is, that Y intercept, if it's two, then you have a straight line at two. And if it's seven, you have a straight line at seven. And if it's negative 852, then you have a straight line at negative 852. That will never change. So those are two kind of special ones. Um, and like I just said, we were going to talk about them. So horizontal lines, that's another way of thinking about your constant function. Those are the y equals b. Um, those are functions. Remember from 1.2, we can tell a function if we can graph it and then draw a vertical line through it, and it only hits your graph in one spot. And if you have a horizontal line, like I've drawn, uh, drawn here, no matter where you draw a vertical line through that, you're only going to hit your line one time. And so this is a function. And the slope is always going to be 0, always. If you have a horizontal line, the slope is zero. If you think about walking across the classroom or walking across your living room, hopefully there's no slope to that floor. You don't really want a slope in your house or in your building because that means there's something wrong with the foundation. But if you are walking along a floor, you don't want there to be a slope. You want it to be level. And so that's a horizontal line. Your floor is horizontal. 
the flip side of that is let's look at vertical lines for a minute. So horizontal lines were y equals b or f of x equals b, whichever way you want to think about it. Um, but vertical lines are x equals a. So if you look at the picture that I have here, wherever that x value is, that's what runs vertically. And so it's x equals, you know, three or x equals negative four. That's your vertical line. These are not functions, though. Vertical lines can never be functions because they are a vertical line themselves. If I draw a vertical line right on that A value, then I am hitting that line infinitely many times. And so it doesn't work. Um, the slope is also undefined in this case, because if I'm trying to think about slope as is um, rise over run, which is what we're going to see here in just a second. Actually, I can scroll up a little bit and you can see this if I can move my make my video a little bit smaller. Here we go. Slope, hopefully you remember, is rise over run, which is our change in our y's over our change in our x's. But with our vertical lines, we don't have any change in our x's, which means the denominator is zero. And we can't have a denominator of zero when we talk about uh, fractions because that makes them undefined. Thus, the slope of a vertical line is undefined. So if you look over here at horizontal lines, the slope is zero. We have zero over the, that's not a hashtag, that's a number symbol, over any given number. Because what happens here is if it's rise over run, that's your change in your y's. Well, you have no change in y's if it's a horizontal line. And so that's zero over, it doesn't matter what your x's are. Um, because zero divided by any number is always going to be zero. So this is a key important issue here, that zero divided by a number is zero. A number divided by zero is undefined. Um, I usually stick that on the final exam for my college algebra students because it is such an integral thing. Um, if you don't understand that and you're presented with X equals a number, a lot of times students will graph it incorrectly and thus get the problem wrong because they're not thinking about the fact that there is no Y to, or there is no change in the X. And so it's just a vertical line. So make sure that you do mark those down. Um, make sure you do understand the difference between how horizontal lines work and how vertical lines work. Again, horizontal lines are functions. That's our constant function that we listed up here. These vertical lines are not functions. They're still lines and we can still um, graph them and everything like that. They're just not a function. So slope, that's the big thing for this section. Slope is always indicated by this lowercase m. Up here at the top where we said the linear function is f of x equals mx plus b, that m is the slope. And that B, in case you want to write it down, is your y-intercept. Um, so slope is always given as rise over run. So that's your change in your y's, like the way that it changes vertically, over the change in your x's or how it changes horizontally. This, um, I wrote it that way, change in y's over change in x's. And then you have this y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. You get those y1s, x1s, those points from two different ordered pairs. Whether you pick them off of a graph, like you have a graph of a line and you pick two ordered pairs that lie on the line and thus you can come up with the slope of that line. Or if it gives you in the problem, like we're gonna do here, if it gives you two points, you're able to find the slope from those two points. Um, when we get to that problem, you'll see it doesn't really matter which point is the first point and which point is the second point. And that's nice because we don't have to, you know, have specific rules on that. But what you're doing is you're taking the Y value of the second point minus the Y value of the first, and then putting that over the X value of the second point minus the X value of the first. Oh, I haven't moved enough, excuse me. So, Gotta go do some jumping jacks to get the lights back on. The other thing that's noted here is that in general, you know, we saw for horizontal lines, we have a slope of zero. And for vertical lines, we have an undefined slope. You can also have positive slopes and negative slopes. Positive slopes will always look like this first graph right here, where if you look at the graph from left to right, 
the line goes upward. So you have a positive slope. And as you read the second graph from left to right, notice it goes down. So that is a negative slope. It's good to have those very generic pictures here at the very beginning, because as you are asked to graph things, sometimes you'll forget or drop a negative. And then when you graph, let's say you had a negative slope you were supposed to get, but when you graph it, you got a positive one. Like you can do a very quick mental check there at the very end of your graphing process. And that allows you to make sure that you didn't accidentally leave a negative somewhere. So those are good to have there. What we're going to do now is we're actually going to find the slope of some lines. Um, and I think there are five. One, two, three, four, five. There's five of them that we're going to do. And if you have my notes pulled up separately or you've printed them off, then you already have all the answers and things like that. But I'm going to go through them one at a time and work through them so you can see how we do this process. Um, and you can see the first two are actually given here on the screen share, but I have them written up here on the board as well. And for each of these examples, we are asked to find the slope. If you are able to write the equation in this y equals mx plus b form, then you don't actually have to do anything else because from that form, you are given the slope. Remember, y equals mx plus b, I'm going to write it right here y equals mx plus b. That m is the slope. So if I look at this first one, I have y equals negative 2x plus 3. This negative 2 is the m, which means our slope for this first one is negative 2. There's nothing else that we actually have to do for that one because it's already written in the slope-intercept form. So that one's pretty easy. The second one is not written in the slope-intercept form. Don't just think, oh, well, it's negative 4. Be careful with that, because what this is saying is we have y equals negative 4 times the 3 minus x. So we have to use our distributive property in order to multiply that negative 4 inside. So I'm going to have y equals, and then I'm going to take negative 4 times 3, which is negative 12. Then I take negative 4 times negative x, Negative and negative will give me a positive 4x. Now, this isn't written as y equals mx plus b, so I'm going to move things around. I can do that in algebra. I'm going to write the 4x first, and then I'll have my minus 12. Now, it is written as y equals mx plus b. Yes, this does say a minus, and that's okay, because you could think of it as a plus a negative 12, um, so that's not a big deal if this is a, a minus instead of a plus. Um, but from this, y equals mx plus b, my m in this case is positive 4. So that's why you want to be careful that you don't just look at the first and think, oh, well, that's going to give me a negative 4 slope, because that's not actually true. You have to do the distributive property first. All right, for c... We need to find the slope of a line through these two different points. We have the point 5, 5 and the point 0, 3. And so what we're going to do, since we have point 1 and a point 2, is we're going to use our slope formula. We're going to have, I sometimes will like to label these. We have x1, y1, and x2, y2. Now, this is where it does not matter at all if 5, 5 is your first point or 5, 5 is your second point. If you don't believe me, you can pause the video or mute me for a minute and you could do this problem with them switched and you'll see that we get the exact same slope because it doesn't matter which one is x1, y1 and which one is x2, y2. What does matter is that I don't take my x1, my 5, and say that that's paired up with my y2, which is 3, because then I have a completely different ordered pair. So you don't want to intermix your values, but it doesn't change anything if this is my second point and this is my first point. What I usually do is whatever order they give it to me in the problem, that's the order I leave it in just so I don't mess up where they go. And like I said, sometimes you can even label them like this, and then it becomes a plug and chug style problem. Um, additionally, what I'm going to say is that because I am using the slope 
equation, the y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, I'm going to write that down. Anytime I'm using a formula or a new form or anything like that, I'm going to write it down every single time that I use it because then it helps me to remember it. This isn't math 20. This isn't math 30. This is college algebra. And so you are going to be expected to have a lot of these formulas memorized. There's not going to be cheat sheets. There's not going to be all that kind of stuff that maybe you've had in the past. And so it is very important that we do learn these as we use these. So slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So my y2, the way that I have it labeled, is 3 minus my y1, which is 5, all over x2, which is 0, minus my x1, which is 5. 3 minus 5 is a negative 2 over 0 minus 5 is a negative 5. Now we have a negative over a negative, so that's going to simplify down into two fifths. Slopes can be fractions, totally fine. They can be improper fractions, so it could have been five over two could have been our slope, and that's okay. What you don't want to do is you do not want to give a decimal representation for these slopes. You want to leave them as fractions. But you do want to make sure that they are simplified. So two fifths is totally fine. If I had four tenths, I would want to make sure that I simplified that um, before moving on. So do be careful about that. Let me scroll up a tiny bit. There you can see the next one because I have to scroll you down. And I know that there's reflection, and I do apologize. If I turn off the overhead lights in this room entirely, it seems like it's too dark for you to actually see. And so I'm going to try and have make sure the problems are on the screen share on my notes itself. But I'm going to work them live up here. And hopefully there's not too much glare that makes it too big of a problem. OK, this one's going to work exactly the same way. It's a line through the point 10, negative 4 and 10, negative 7. So I'm going to have just for this first day, I'm going to go ahead and label these x1, y, or excuse me, x2, y2. But after this day, I'm not going to keep labeling them like that. I will always write down the formula, though, so that I know what I'm using. So slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So in this case, my y2 is negative 7. And then my y1 is negative 4. Now, the equation says minus my y1. So I'm going to have minus a minus. Those double negatives, you got to watch out for them. That becomes a positive. Okay? And if you need to do the intermittary, intermittary? That's not a word. The intermittent step of where you have negative 7 minus, and then in parentheses, you have minus form, totally fine as well. When it comes to my notes, and especially when it comes to my lectures in class, I'm going to skip a lot of that, but I will mention it as we work through it. Now, my x2 was 10 minus my x1, which is also 10. So I have negative 3 over 0, and hopefully you're like, wait a second, we can't do that. And you're right, we can't do that. What that means is that we have an undefined slope because you can't uh, divide by zero. So our slope is undefined. And hopefully you can tell me what this graph is going to look like if you were asked to graph it. Because undefined slopes only happen at x equals a number. In this case, it would be x equals 10, which is our vertical line, our vertical line graph. So this is an undefined slope. And that's what it looks like as you work through the problem and you actually get that. All right, this last one, um, again, I apologize for the glare. It says line width, line width, and then we have f of 1 equals 2 and f of 2 equals 4. So this type of formatting or writing down these values is from our function notation, which we talked about in 1.2. So the function at 1 equals 2, and the function at 2 equals 4. 
And you're like, okay, but those aren't ordered pairs. So how do I use that? Well, they actually are ordered pairs because remember this says F of X, F of X. So what's inside the parentheses is our X value. This is our X one. And the output that we get whenever we find a function at a given point is our y value. So this is our y one. And then we come over here and this is our x2 and this is our y2. So they actually did give us ordered pairs. They just gave it to us in a different format so that we can see what that looks like as well. But we still just have two ordered pairs so we can use our slope formula. M equals not x, y2. That's another mistake you can make where you put your x's on top instead of your y's, and that will result in the wrong uh, slope. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. y2 is 4, because that's its value, minus y1, which is 2, all over x2, which is 2, minus x1, which is 1. 4 minus 2 is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1, 2 over 1 is 2. So we have a slope of 2 for that last example. So hopefully slope isn't something, like I said, that's entirely new to you. Um, hopefully this is a little bit, oh, sorry, I hit my board. A um, little bit of a review. Maybe you have to dust off some cobwebs and stuff from Algebra 1 or from Math 20 or whatever the last classes that you encountered this in. Um, but if you're making like a big list, which I kind of recommend doing, of important uh, formulas, I definitely recommend writing down the slope formula. This y equals mx plus b, I would write that down on there. I would also write down the y, or excuse me, I said y equals mx plus b. I would write that down and I'd write the slope formula, this y equal or m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And maybe just like at the front of your notebook, make a big list of different formulas and things that you encounter. And I'll try to address them as we go throughout the lectures of this is one you should know, this one's one you should memorize, and you can just kind of add it to your list so that you can reference it. But that's slope. Now, what is the... Like, why do we learn slope so much? Well, because maybe you're going to go on and you're going to take calculus. Uh, maybe you're not. That's okay, too. But if you go on and take calculus, calculus is really all about the average rate of change. That's what they call it. But really, the average rate of change is the slope of a line that runs through two different data points. The difference between slope and the average rate of change really isn't anything, except usually the graph that it's referencing, like in the picture we see here. The graph is actually this curve right here, this big wonky curve thing. Not all graphs are nice straight lines. And so when we're talking about the slope of a not straight, um, I can't say line, but not straight graph, then what we have to think about is we pick two points and we talk about the slope through those, which isn't the slope through the curve right here per se, it's the slope through this tangent line. We call that a tangent line. And all of that is covered in calculus because what we talk about is we want to minimize the difference between the slope of the line and the slope of this curve. And we want to figure out as much as possible what that actual curve is. And so if you ever see average rate of change, it's the exact same thing as finding the slope, though. <laughs> These lights, man. I might just have to teach you in the dark because that's twice now that they've gone off. So just note, average rate of change, same thing as slope. If you hear about that, if you go on in math, if you take calculus, you're really finding the slope of tangent lines to the curve, and then you learn integration and all that other kind of fun stuff. The next problem we're gonna do is actually gonna be out of our textbook. So I'll screen share that with you. And it is kind of using this average rate of change, but I wanted you to see it in person. And it's this example number four which is on page number 37 in your textbook. You always have access to your textbook via the Pearson site, the My Math Lab site. And so instead of rewriting the problem or doing anything like that, I'm just screen sharing that page with you. 
So this is an application problem. This is a real world problem. And so we're gonna do it. It says we're doing the food stamp program and the number of people participating in the Federal Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or food stamps has increased from 17.2 million in 2000 to 47.6 million in 2013. The following graph illustrates this upward trend. It wants us to find the average data up, or excuse me, the average rate of change in the number of people using food stamps from 2000 to 2013. So if you look at the picture that they give us, this isn't a straight line. It's, it's a curvy, changey line. And so we can't just say, well, we're gonna find the slope there. We're gonna find the average rate of change. And so we're gonna think about if we connected those two data points on that graph itself, then what would we find the slope of that line to be? Because that is our average rate of change. And so the average rate of change is found the exact same way as slope, okay? Average rate of change. You use the exact same formula. You use y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's the exact same process. So in this case, since we have a uh, point on the left that is in 2000, and we have a point on the right that's in 2003, I'm going to let this 2000 point be my x1, y1, and I'm going to let 2013 be my x2, y2. So in this case, my y2 will be this 47.6, and I'm going to subtract from that my y1, which was 17.2. And hopefully those numbers look familiar because you just read them in the board problem itself. The 47.6 is the number of people on food stamps in 2013, and the 17.2 was the number of people on food stamps in 2000. Then in the bottom is our change in our X's, which is our actual years. So our X2 was 2013 minus 2000. Notice they number, like they match up. The 47.6 is in 2013. The 17.2 was in the year 2000. So now we're going to subtract those and we have 30.4 over 13. Now I just got done telling you, keep them in fractions, but this one's a decimal inside of a fraction and it's an application problem. In general, when you have an application problem, it will tell you like in your homework and in your quizzes, whether or not to use a simplified fraction or to use a decimal representation. And in this case, we are told, even though it doesn't stay there, we are told that we are going to approximate this to one decimal place, to the tenth place. And so if you type in 30.4 divided by 13 into your calculator, you will get approximately, that's what the curly or the wavy equal signs mean. They mean approximately 2.3. So there is an approximate average rate of change of 2.3 between the years 2000 and 2013. So that means that's how much it is going up every year. Okay, so that's how we do a real world problem using the average rate of change, which is really just a way of using slope to find the slope of curved um, graphs. Let's go back to our notes. There's our example. So now we're gonna talk about the slope intercept form. That's the form that I'm talking about. That's very good to list on your formulas page or on the things you want to memorize. This f of x equals mx plus b or y equals mx plus b. This form of linear function is the easiest way to graph lines. Easiest way bar none. If you can write an equation in y equals mx plus b form or f of x equals mx plus b form, then you are set up and ready to graph that. It is so easy. And we're going to do that in just a minute. So the first thing we're going to do, though, is we're going to find the slope and the y-intercept from a given equation. Now, the equation they give us, though, this 3x minus 6y minus 7 
equals zero. Now that is not written in y equals mx plus b form. And if I'm just looking at that, I have no idea what the slope is. I have no idea what the y-intercept is. So what I need to do is I need to move things around so that it looks like y equals mx plus b. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is get y by itself. And if I'm getting y by itself, then I need to subtract my 3x over and add my 7x over to the other side so that I get negative 6y equals a negative 3x plus 7. We use the opposites method to move things over. y is almost by itself, but I've got to divide it by negative 6, which means I've got to divide every term on the right-hand side by negative 6 as well. That'll give me y equals, I have negative 3 divided by negative 6. The negatives will go away. 3 and 6 have a 3 in common, so that will leave me with a 1 over 2x minus 7 over 6. Now, you might say, well, wait a second. Was an x on top before I did this? Yes, it is. But when x is on top, you can pull it out to the side and sit it right next to it, which actually then puts it in the y equals mx plus b form, which makes it a little bit easier and more friendly to look at and find the information that they're asking for. Because what they're asking for is they want to know what the slope is, and they want to know what the y-intercept is, and they want the y-intercept to be listed as an ordered pair. Okay, so those are the two things we are looking for y-intercept. So slope, if we have this in y equals mx plus b, is our m. So our slope in this case is 1 half. The intercept is the b. As you can see right here in this little explanation, y equals mx plus b. The b is our y-intercept, which is listed as 0 comma b. So in this case, our b is negative. So that means we have 0, comma, negative 7, 6. That is our y-intercept. Oops, sorry. And that is the b. Because you could have written this as y equals 1 half x plus the negative 7, 6. If that helps you, write it like that. Um, to me, it doesn't make it any harder for me to leave it with the minus like this. Because if it says plus, then I know it's positive. If it says negative, then I know it's negative. It's not going in opposite direction or anything like that. But you can find the slope in the y-intercept simply by getting it into the y equals mx plus b form. Now, I did mention that getting a equation into y equals mx plus b form is the easiest way then to graph a line. Um, we saw in 1.2 that we were pretending we didn't know how to graph anything. And if we pretend we don't know how to graph anything, the only way to graph things is the point plotting system. And that takes a lot of time. You have to plug in a whole bunch of X's and plug out a whole bunch of Y's. And then we have to plot all the points and see what happens. With our Y equals MX plus B form, we can actually learn how to graph. And so here's the steps that you can take in order to graph a line using the slope intercept form. Step one, you have to get the equation into y equals mx plus b form. This equation did not start that way, so we had to get it there. Um, sometimes you're lucky and they're gonna give it to you in the y equals mx plus b form and you're gonna be ready to graph straight off of that. But if they don't give it to you in the y equals mx plus b form, you're gonna have to manipulate it around until you get there. Once you get there, you need to identify the y-intercept and plot that on your Cartesian coordinate system. Then you will use the slope to plot a second point, and I'll show you how to do that. Once you have two points, you're actually ready to graph a line. A line only needs two different points. Sometimes they'll ask you for a third one just to make sure that you didn't um, like do an algebra error but you're never gonna be asked for a third point and then have to plot that third point. You only need two points in order to graph a line. And I was very kind in the example that I found for you that it's already gonna be written in the y equals mx plus b form. 
So we don't have to do all that algebra and move things around at this starting point. We can just look at it to get the information and go from there. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab, or not grab, draw my Cartesian coordinate plane so that we are ready to graph. Let's go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Seven, eight. Okay. So there is our beautiful Cartesian coordinate system that we're going to graph on. And here is our fabulous equation that we are going to graph. Now, step one said to, or step two says to find the y intercept. That's your b over here. Remember, you can always write it as zero, comma, whatever the b value is. So in this case, zero, comma, four is our y intercept. So I'm gonna go ahead and graph that over here on my Cartesian coordinate system. I'm gonna go up one, two, three, four. I'm gonna make it very large because I don't have a different color to differentiate it. So there is zero, four. Now I said you can use the slope then to graph a second line. So let's identify the slope, which is negative two over three. Now, to use the slope to plot a second point, we have to look at the slope itself. Slope is negative. So hopefully right there you're like, okay, wait, negative means my line's gonna fall as I move from left to right. And you are correct. So hopefully if we start graphing our second point and it ends up up here and we have a positive slope, we will pause and think about it for a second and realize we did something wrong. But remember, Slope is the change in your y, so your vertical change, over your change in your x's, which is your horizontal change. So if I look at a graph, and if the top number tells me my change in my y's and it's negative, well, ask yourself, if is my negative y's up here or are my negative y's down? Do I go up to get smaller y's or do I go down? I'm going to go down. So this negative two tells me I'm gonna go down two units. I'm gonna go down two units. And this positive three, if I'm looking at my, my Cartesian coordinate system, where are my positive x's? Like if I'm starting at zero, zero, are my positive x's to the left or are my positive x's to the right? Well, my positive x's are to the right. So I need to go to the right then three units. So if I start from the point that I have plotted, my zero, four, I need to then move down two and to the right three, and I will be at a second point that lies on this line. So I'm gonna go down two, one, two, and to the right three, one, two, three. And that'll put me over here at three comma two. And then if I connect these two points, notice that I have a line that has a negative slope. So just a quick check, I can see that I have a negative slope, which is what I needed based on the original equation. So using the slope will tell you which directions to go. If it says negative on top, you're moving down. If it says negative on bottom, you're moving to the left. If it says positive on top, you're going up. And if it says positive on bottom, you're going to move to the right. Um, just a little side note, because I don't have another example, I'm going to work with you on this. If you had a slope that was a positive 2, write it as a fraction. How do you write whole numbers as a fraction? You stick them over 1. So I would stick this two over one, and then I could figure out where to go with my next point. I would go up two, because that's positive, and then I would move to the right one, because that's also positive. So even if you have a whole number as your slope, you're gonna have two different movements. You're gonna move up or down, you're gonna move vertically, and then you're gonna move horizontally. You will never just move one direction. You have to move up, like you have to move vertically and you have to move horizontally for your slope. Um, 
Because if you don't, if I only move upward, then I'm just going to have a vertical line. And if I only move horizontally, then I'm just going to have a horizontal line. So that's how you would change a slope that is a whole number into a fraction and thus be able to use that information to graph. And that's actually the end of this lesson.